Hello, I'm Paul Johnson. I'm with the Optimistic American, and we're here to talk about hope. I'm here with uh, Chuck Coughlin. Um, now, Chuck has a really special, interesting uh, background. Here's the most important one. I got to know Chuck when he worked for Fife Symington, kind of running his office, and he spent most of his time beating up on me. Oh, you just felt that way. Uh, oh, come on. That was your job. <laughs> That's your trauma. <laughs> that <was my laughs> trauma, yes. So, by the way, so my second name for this show was Paul the Confessor. And this was your chance to come and apologize. I wanted to give you that. Uh, of course, I ask for your forgiveness, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> uh, now, Chuck, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to really start by focusing on, uh, on you and your background. Yeah. You have an incredible background representing lots of political candidates on both sides. Uh, you represented my son. I appreciated that. Um, but you've represented Democrats, Republicans. You've also done a lot of lobbying. You've also worked in a governor's office. You've worked for a United States senator. I want to know what, what got you into this crazy business? Well, my father was a corporate labor lawyer in Detroit uh, wow. from the late 50s now until I know what you the late 80s. Uh -huh. uh, and he, our dinner table conversation every night was uh, revolved around his negotiations, the negotiations he would take part in every day. Jimmy Hoffa was on the other side of the table once. I'm lucky uh, I have knees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but my, that's the funny thing. My dad was a very peaceful man. He was a very even-keeled, funny New Englander. He came from Boston, fought in World, you know, Dartmouth, uh, World War II, Michigan law. And then, you know, met my mother in Ann Arbor, who was a townie. I mean, she was a loud, brash, very opinionated uh, a woman who uh, he met when they were, you know, he'd go to breakfast one morning, every morning at the same restaurant, and she was waiting at the table. And one time he said, well, I'd like to take you out. And she goes, well, you're married. And she, he goes, why do you think that? And she goes, well, you're wearing a hat. Uh, <laughs> so wear it was a fedora. Anymore? It was oh, a fedora. Okay. And she just thought that made him look more mature. And so uh, the rest is history. They, you know, she, she, I remember as a kid, my mom being, uh, you know, calling into the local radio show and railing on people. And that would never be my dad. So I, but I grew up aware constantly that there were people making decisions about my life in the environment in which I lived in that were going to affect me. And I said, well, I want to be a part of that someday. And so that was my MO during college. And my life was to go do internships at different places and learn how the environment around us shapes what we believe and forms our opinions and how I could use that to help either candidates or clients uh, to succeed in the public world in which we live in. All right. So first campaign, what was it? John, well, that was a campaign for Congress in Ohio in 1984. Um, a Republican in Cuyahoga County, which was a deeply, deeply Democratic area. Um, and I was doing fundraising for the candidate. Uh, and uh, and the re remarkable, that's where I met John McCain uh, in that first campaign. Uh, and I think the funny story there was I took him into a VFW hall in uh, the southern part of the district. I think it was Parma, Ohio, where nobody's name, everybody's name ended in a vowel. And it was a tough crowd. And it was a VFW uh, convention and uh, gathering and took him in there. And um, you know, it was World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, um, everybody, every age group, tough, tough crowd. I mean, it was a working class crowd. And he got up there and I'd put out all the literature on John everybody's did. table. John yeah. Did. Okay. He got up there and I'd put the literature out about the crown prince. And, you know, this is when nobody knew him. I mean, he was a congressman from uh, Arizona, a uh, two term congressman from Arizona. And nobody really knew him. And he got up on the stage and he goes, uh, how y'all doing today? You know, any Marines in the house? And, you know, got the got the hoo -ah. And he goes, you know, I always think about you guys on Mother's Day, um, the, or on, on Father's Day, rather. I always think of you guys on Father's Day because, you know, I know many of you don't know your dad. And the whole thing went quiet. And and every there wasn't a laugh in the house. Yeah, I'm wondering. What asserting, that's well, asserting that they were bastard children and never <laughs> knew their dad okay <laughs> and it went dead quiet in the house and uh he then started laughing at his joke uh -huh. and then they all started laughing at his joke because <laughs> for a minute there i didn't think we were gonna get out of the room alive <laughs> i literally thought this was the end uh -huh. of the show for me uh -huh. and we're gonna carry us both out in a body bag and uh he, he started laughing then they started laughing and i knew i had something real 
at that point. I knew I had a, a candidate who had a sense of himself, a confidence about him, and somebody who could had a rapport with the communities that he could, and no fear. Uh, and he was real. You knew he was real. And so I followed him out here uh, in 85 uh, to run uh, to work on his first Senate campaign. And he was. He was the real deal. And that's that's a weird thing to find. Right. So in when a I campaign. first started working with Senator McCain, yeah. he also was beating the hell out of me <laughs> on a regular basis, <laughs> always mad at me over something. I was yeah. mayor. He was uh, a U.S. senator. Yeah. Was he like that to everyone? Was it uh, what, what was his personality like? Uh, very uh, charming. But you didn't want to get on the wrong side of that. Um, you did not want to get on the wrong side of that, which I did uh, a number of times. Uh, and I'd say it was one of his uh, weaknesses at the end of his, uh, it, towards the, in his career. It was hard to cultivate an audience around him who were truth tellers to him because you would pay a price for telling him the truth. Uh, and he'd get angry. And, you know, he, he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't, uh, couldn't, had a difficult time adjusting to that environment. And what I later learned in life was, you know, it, to be successful in public life, you need to surround yourself with really smart people. You need to encourage them to be square with you. And you're the candidate or you're, it's your name on the door. But that doesn't mean that other people can't speak to you and you have to hear the truth. Um, and the best public officials that I've ever worked for cultivate that environment. And they cultivate an environment where uh, you can speak to them very, very candidly. Senator McCain, after he lost his first run for the presidency, but before he ran the second time and became the nominee, uh, again, we fought all the time. But I'd already left the mayor's office. I'd lost a race for governor. I'm standing in a crowd with a number of other people there. He comes in with all the secret service that you could imagine uh, he would have to have. Um, and we both kind of gave one another a little bit of a bad look as he walked by. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a good friend of mine was standing next to me, Wayne Howard, and he turned back around, came over and said, hey, can I speak to you for a minute? I said, sure. And uh, he pulled me out and he said, uh, look, he said, I spent a lot of time in a concentration camp. He said, I've my whole life had this feeling since then that there were people who were on my side and my enemies. And he said, I wasn't fair to you while you were mayor. Yeah. And he goes, I just want you to know, I'm sorry. Wayne standing next to me said, that did not just happen in front of <laughs> <laughs> everybody. He had a great sense of himself. He knew that. He would know that and he would recognize it. But it's handling that in the moment of that conflict and what it cultivated around him because he would come back to that and he would be great friends with everybody around him because everybody adored him, really liked him. I had lifelong relationships with some of our friends that mm -hmm. that you know you, you could go to the grave with some many have mm -hmm. uh and that that that's the kind of relationship you want but uh it would take time and that circle was not large and it would take him time to recognize that because one of the things I think we don't recognize about many ourselves is the you know we don't look at ourselves as extremely powerful you know i i try to act humbly and not try i am because i realize you know i'm the worst of all sinners right i i get it and i've gotten that notion in my life now but you know that that you have to understand that about yourself and i don't think john ever really understood the power with it which he spoke and the and the you know because like you said he was in a prison camp mm -hmm. and so a powerless figure um, and so when he could speak, when he did speak, I mean, it was powerful. And so, you know, him understanding that about that, I don't think that resonated with him a lot of the time. All right. I want to come back to this because, I mean, he and I became very good friends after that apology. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. the difference it made in both of our lives. And a little similar story with us. I mean, we, we've built up a <laughs> friendship. But after you left McCain's office, you went to work for um, uh, Governor Symington Eventually. and then later another governor. Yeah. Um, tell me how that happened and what it was like working in his office. I mean, did you do anything other than beat me up on a regular <laughs> basis? <laughs> Yeah, well, that was just that was like that was like a tip at dinner. Oh, I that think. was sport. Yeah, I see. Sport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I got an opportunity. I, I went to work for an agency similar to mine, and I ran dozens of statewide campaigns. And I had a lot of experience in doing that, budgeting, cash flow, communications, all of that on how to structure a statewide campaign or a local campaign, for that matter. Um, I then went to work for our friend Grant for a while. 
um, our attorney general. Um, I left there, went into the private sector. And then when Fife was running in this cycle you were talking about in 94, they needed somebody to run a statewide campaign. And I was called and I said, you know, would you take a leave of absence to go run the campaign? And I said, sure, that would be fun. Um, he was a remarkable governor. He had governed very conservatively, had a tremendous record of, of accomplishment on a policy side, but was besieged by personal demons from his personal life and his personal business life that had preceded his governorship. Well, he and I uh, obviously had Similar, our differences. Yeah. What was amazing to me was where Fife Symington came from. My first yeah. introduction to him in politics was he was supporting the Martin Luther King Day yep. and opposing Evan Meekham. Yes. He wasn't just exactly what you would expect. No, he was a, you know, you'd Fife, J. Fife Symington III. That's exactly <laughs> what you thought it was, or you <laughs> thought that that creates a picture That's of exactly you right. of a uh, son of Eastern wealth uh, out here in Arizona. And he was not what you thought he was. Um, a very interesting guy. Um, one of those guys that would build a round table. He wanted to hear what other people were saying. He was very intent on having opinions brought to him so he could hear them. I love that because it creates a sense of camaraderie and confidence in a room and leadership. It's really how the way to lead. And he was an example of that. So we ended up running um, a, a very difficult primary in that cycle because of his previous stuff. Governor's race, as a governor, great. He had a development life before that that ultimately took him down in, with, in, in his second term. Uh, and then had, had you guys were running a primary then, and we were actually most fearful of you because you were a new Democrat. You were the new Democrat, which would be hard to frame. Um, that was a centrist, maybe center left, center right. You couldn't really get boxed with you because you were a, 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 a mayor who had run the state's largest city, very young and entrepreneurial, not ideological. So you were looked at as, to me, as a problem solver type of guy. And we didn't want you. I did not want you as an opponent. So there was rim shots we would take consistently while you were in a very difficult primary with a former um, uh, uh, mayor, uh, Terry Goddard, and the state's most popular guy, Eddie Basha, who ran a grocery store chain. I remember the line that you guys had, the uh, youthful in protuberance. I was like, <laughs> I don't even know what in protuberance <laughs> means. <laughs> that may have been Hyler. Because uh, those $5 words didn't come out of me. But he, uh, uh -huh. you know, so we didn't want you. I didn't, I knew that. And so every time you would make a mistake, we would point it out. We, we would go out of our way to take a shot at you and go, well, there's Paul again, you know. And I do remember one time towards the end of that, your primary election, which you lost in that cycle and Eddie Basha won, uh -huh. which became a huge problem to us right away because he was such a nice and popular guy. Um, but when you, you'd always make a mistake, we, we'd take a shot at you. And when I realized you weren't going to win, I think I said on the record to a reporter, I said, yeah, it's time to stick, stick a fork, fork in him and pull him off the grill. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I said it sort of chuggingly yeah. in it, but I, you know, later I was like, yeah, I probably when you're trying, when you're, when you're trying to win that. a campaign, that's the, that's, actually, that that's was a, what you do. Yeah, right? that's what you that's do. You take the shot and yeah. then, you know, but we ended up running a campaign against Eddie Basher, nicest guy on the planet. But as we said in that campaign, nice guys don't govern. You know, he he can't say no to anybody. And so we built a whole narrative around that uh, with a record of that he had established through his political givings and political practices. And the thing about a guy who's never run for office before, they just don't know what it's like. All right. And so it's hard. So let me use this to transition to this concept, um, the fear that the public has that the system doesn't yeah. work. And, and I don't want to focus on the parties yet. I want to focus no. on the system, the system yeah. that our founders yeah. laid out. You've worked at both levels. What's your view? Does the system work? Is it failing us? It's changed. And, and nobody should think that, that the system as we have today is what, what we've always had. If you look back historically at the, the history of the country, it's always changed. We've had different parties. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Democratic Party used to be the conservative party. The Whigs went away. Mm -hmm. You know, there was different forms of elections. But one of the things that, you know, you look back to founding documents, as you said, and you can say uh, what Washington, uh, Hamilton, 
and Madison, both guys who wrote the Federalist Papers, at, clearly saw was uh, the, uh, the factions, that factions would develop. Washington was such a unique figure and a founding figure of the country that nobody wanted to really oppose him. He was a, a godlike figure, um, a father-like figure to the entire country. So his presence created a real uh, uh, attitude of we're going to serve. We're going to serve this guy, which is a good leadership mm -hmm. instinct. And and the remarkable thing about him is he finally resigned. I mean, and that's part of that funny Hamilton scene where the king comes on and goes, you can resign, you know, <laughs> I can leave. And he does. And then then it starts. And you, you get Adams and Jefferson who are bitterly opposed to each other. You, you can say philosophically from a federalist states rights standpoint, that's still a tension point in our country. But what that grew into was partisanship. Although and both, all three of those people I mentioned before wrote extensively, Washington in his farewell address, Madison and Hamilton in the Federalist Papers about the fac factions and the and the pernicious effects of parties and what they would become. We are now there. Yeah, Jefferson said if I had to go to heaven with the party, I'd prefer not to go at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, Washington told us be wary of three things, uh, foreign divide or foreign involvements internal divides and partisan politics. Yeah. Um, but I also find it interesting that Hamilton and Jefferson, who did not get along, thank God we had both of them. Both of them contributed amazing things to this country on the right and on the left, however that was defined at that time. And that's part of the spiritual part of understanding, you know, whether you go to Eastern mysticism and the yin and the yang or the power of the Holy Spirit and what, you know, God's got a plan. It's probably not yours. Yeah. And he's and what happens in life is conflicts get presented. And, you know, great verse in Leviticus, anger, anger resides in the lap of fools that I came to that later in life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go, OK, well, what does that mean? And so how do I handle that conflict? I am my business is all about conflict. It, it is. I'm born in conflict every single day. Clients, campaigns, lobbying personalities, all of that. So how do you manage that? You know, you have to have a good physical um, plant skill set to do that, a, um, a, a hardware system or a software system to do that, budgets, talking points, polling data, all of that stuff. But you also have to have the hardware side of it, the, the built-in spiritual side of it on how to deal with conflict. So when you start I, I I believe you represent counties or cities. I can't remember we do, which one. Both. Yeah, both. Yes. So when you represent them, I know they uh, just from being a mayor. I know that we had issues all the time at the legislature, and usually thought we were going to lose, yeah. right? Because they're just geared more towards other interests than they were our interests. When you represent them, how, how do you take on an issue that you know is going to be controversial and find a way to to bring about success? A great one was in the last session. So the governor wanted to cut income taxes in the state of Arizona. The cities share a portion of that income tax on an age-old deal, but they get a portion of that state income tax. In the cut that he was proposing was also going to be a cut to the cities and towns. As you said, what do they care? You know, that's your part of the matrix too. Well, we pointed out to them, Republican-dominated legislature, that 50% of most municipal budgets go to police and fire. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, we never thought we'd see Republicans cutting public safety and cutting police budgets. Is that something you want to do? You found a way to align interests. Absolutely. You, you got, you have to find ways to find what your opponent, you know, that's a classic negotiating technique, right? And so- Is it you, valuable you, to the system to find absolutely. common ground? Oh, you have to, mm -hmm. because then conflict just gets perpetuated for, for conflict's sake. Mm -hmm. And so the winners then are just the partisan divide that's using that partisan anger or uh, dispute to benefit themselves. You know, the, and people have a hard time understanding that. But when you go down and, and you know, the love your enemies, right? That's, that's the hardest thing to do. It's the highest command in the book. You know, love your enemies um, like yourself. And you're like, really? I don't feel like doing that. Um, but that's where you learn. That's where you can grow.
that's where you understand what your opponent's, um, your enemy's motivations are. And so how do I make those motivations? What can I identify about mine that's equal with that? Or what do I identify within that that I can use for my benefit? Do you have to stay open to working with people that maybe you don't like? <sighs> It's absolutely a key. It's part of my mantra in life. Stay open, stay open, stay open, and then open up some more until it really hurts mm -hmm. um, because you have to do that. Once you close yourself off, and we do that as we get older in life, right? We, and that's okay if you're not going to be in the arena anymore and you're just going home to read books anymore. Um, but in your, when you're in the arena, you have to stay open to learning about yourself and about them and it, then you, because you don't solve problems otherwise, you, you, it's a key component of resolution. And my dad saw that. I mean, and my dad saw that. I saw that around the table with my dad as a, as a kid, you know, he would, he, he would, he didn't like these people he was talking to, but he had to work with them. I had a, uh, an issue we were trying to put in a place, a curfew across the city and uh, for young people. Um, and it was mainly because we had a very large number of young people who ended up getting shoot due to drive-by shootings. Um, so when we put it into place, um, there were there was lots of controversies on it. Um, the um, But one of the issues was that uh, one of the Hispanics on the council um, was upset because she believed that it was going to be anti-kids. So she got involved with it. She and I were on the opposite side of a lot of different issues. I, I, I care a lot about her now, but we disagreed a lot back then. Um, and in her process, well, one of the things she came up with was, well, instead of taking these kids to jail, why don't we take them to a parks facility? So we engaged the parks group, they got involved, they took care of the kids. What it did is the police officers felt way okay with taking these kids to a park facility. They did not want to take them to a jail where they had to sit there right. and wait with them, right. right? What I found to be interesting is how if you take people on both sides mm -hmm. and you listen to them, if you find that common You're always good at that. It's, you're, well, you're a good mayor but, the way you did that. But it's better for society. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you get stuck. I mean, it's like my mom used to say, yeah, I wrote a blog about this the other day, you know, when you're driving along in traffic and you start, what, you stop, you know, you start looking at the wreck on the side of the road. And then there's more wrecks because you're not paying attention to where you're going. Mm -hmm. She used to have a, you know, don't be a looky-loo. Well, the whole culture's become looky loose. Like, let's look at the wreck or the Twitter or whatever's on the side of the road, and let's not pay attention to the road in front of us and where we're going. Mm -hmm. And so you get distracted. And so that's problem solving. Because don't just get stuck on the problem. Get stuck, get focused on how to resolve that by moving forward and beyond it, taking the lesson from that problem and moving forward and beyond it. Today, we get stuck. We okay, get stuck so let's go to the reason. darker side for a moment, the darker <laughs> side of what's happening in politics, the partisan system. Yeah. Um, talk to me about what do you think is happening? What are the changes that have happened with the partisan system? And, and where do you think we go to try to fix this thing? Well, there's been a lot of changes. The functional, uh, the, the, the hardware changes have been um, the, uh, the massive amounts of money that are flowing into the system now as a result of several court decisions, um, Citizens United, and the influx of money into the parties uh, and to um, educational organizations that then also can be political advocacy organizations. That didn't used to be. I mean, candidates, when we were running for governor and you were running for governor in 94, you, you, the party would do some things for you, but all the messaging came from you. Right. You would all, now it comes from all these different places. External sources. And there's money. And most of those, if you know, are all suppressive messaging. They're all designed. What does that mean? It means negative messaging. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, if if I'm in the race to help you and you we have an imaginary third appoint, opponent on the, or second opponent on the third of the table, I'm, by helping you, I'm going to, I'm going to beat the heck out of this guy. What does that do to accountability of the other candidates? It's, it's, it's done. I mean, because then I can, I can just go keep selling ice cream. I can tell everybody I'm the greatest guy in the world while this guy over here has to play offense and defense and you paralyze him and, and you turn off a major portion of the electorate to that guy. Well, that's now happening all across the board. It's Republicans doing it to Democrats, it's Democrats doing it to Republicans, and it is suppressing and creating um, uh, a suppressive atmosphere where people don't want to participate anymore. I don't know why people wouldn't want. So money's one. Number two is the uh, 
the communication systems we live in today. It, come on. I mean, they I, it's showing my age, but when I started the company in 95, uh, the internet was just a baby. Um, we now have massive communication platforms, Twitter, Facebook, uh, 24-hour news networks. I mean, we're all looky-loos now. So, so guys like companies like mine, I can create a distraction for everybody to look at. Look at, look at, look, look at that, look at that, look at that. And then, you know, the rest of the campaign's going on over here while, you know, we're outraged about something here. And I'm going to associate you with that outrage. Um, we saw that with the State of the Union speech the other day. You know, is, is it Biden's fault that we have inflation? Not really. That's been going on for some time now. But all the Republicans are like, oh, it's all Biden's fault. It's Biden's fault. It's Biden's fault. So the amount, the platforms that we operate in. So the results of those two things have created a disincentive. They have polarized both parties even more. So the Republicans and Democrats have moved ex to extremism because most people uh, don't want to participate. They're like, I don't, I don't feel good about that anymore. I, I want to drop out of this or I, I leave the party. So just yesterday in Maricopa County, um, for the first time in the history of modern history, unaffiliated voters became the largest voter segment in uh, Maricopa County. It's bigger than Republicans, bigger than Democrats. Wow. People are leaving. Yeah, They're it's been growing for a, a while, but it finally passed. Leave the Democratic Party, leave the Republican Party, or not even register with either party. And then on top of that, this, the problem then becomes how we elect people. Because we've given these two parties, back to Washington and Hamilton uh, and, and uh, Madison, we've given these two parties complete control over the election cycle. So in order to run, if I want to run, I have to declare a party show, be a member of a party to participate in that primary election. So the primary is the first election in a cycle. The general is the second election. And we elect, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of our candidates are elected um, in the primary. So, so they are the ones that go on to the general. But what most people don't understand is 80% of those people in a primary are elected outright because the way the districts are drawn, they create safe, safe either Democrat or Republican Meaning seats. when they get to the general, they don't have an opponent. They don't even have an opponent. Right. Not a reasonable so there's chance no competition. of losing. I had a great conversation with a member down at the Capitol one time about an issue, and I said, well, our issue in the general election garnered more votes in your, in your district than the governor did. And he goes, well, I don't care about the general election. I only get elected in the primary. I go, okay, okay John, you know, he's a realist. Yep. And I, I laughed because I go, you're right. I mean, that, that's the outcome of the election. And so we've, the, the election as we have it today, the system as it is working today is working exactly how it's designed to work, to elect the most extreme candidates on both sides and then have a general election with with choices that neither side, like the majority of the electorate, because the, the primary only garners about 30% of the overall electorate. So in uh, 2020, in the last general election cycle, uh, we had 80% turnout in the general election. That's the presidential, you know, Biden versus Trump. 80% of Arizonans voted. A record number of people voted in that cycle almost a record percentage, but a record number of people voted. In the primary, there is about, uh, I, I want to say, a million people voted, which was, you know, 30%, 36% wow. of that 80% voted. So a minority part of the electorate is electing everybody. So if you did the math on that, you said, okay, uh, there are... 80% of the people are registered. Yeah. All right. So you got to take out 20% for non-registration. Yeah. Right. Right. And then you say, okay, so of everyone I know, now let's divide it up. Um, only 34%, 35% of Republican, only yeah. 36 So my colleague, Paul, does this great exercise. So imagine yourself, you're in a banquet room with, you know, the, ta the, the audience. So he goes, um, the last two rows of the electorate or the, the room sit down. You're not registered to vote. You don't even count. You're not even registered to vote. Then he goes, the next four rows, sit down. Because you're registered to vote, you don't vote. You don't even participate. 
He goes, the rest of you are the audience that does participate. And he goes, and he works it all the way down to the primary. And you're only left with two rolls of people in, in, that are electing everybody. In, in, and it's a dramatic understanding. And we're going to do some uh, on projects I'm working on right now. We're going to put some graphics together and hopefully let people graphically understand it because they don't. Because I mean, about 10% people... of the people will vote in a Republican primary when you get down to it. About 10% yeah, of Republican Yeah, if you break primary. away those other numbers, yeah. And, and yeah. that means if you just think about of everyone you know, one in 10 will vote in a Republican primary, one yeah. in 10 will vote in a Democratic primary. Yeah. And who are those people? They tend to be, well, you're, you're the, you've done a lot of polling. Who yeah. are they? They're, they're like... For in, it, it, like in the Republican primary this year in Arizona, ninety-five uh, percent of them, eight no, eighty-six percent of them are going to be over fifty. Um, eighty percent of them will live in either Maricopa County, Yavapai County, or Pinal or um, or Pima County. So the rest of the state really doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, they're they're. They're they're very partisan. Vote in all elections. They're uh, demographically, like I just said, is is much older uh, than the overall population. And so you got to be able to figure out how to create an opportunity for more people to participate, and 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 less people, you know, fewer people m making the decisions for everybody is not good. So if I were to try to summarize what you said, and you think about this. We have 435 congressional districts. Yeah. We have 30 state districts for yeah. the legislature. Yeah. Um, I think at the congressional level, about 35 are competitive. Yeah. All the rest are decided in the primary. Yeah. So if you took the congressman, 400 out of the 435 congressmen are going to be decided by 10% of the people. Yeah. And everyone else, they don't even have a say. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And the same is happening in your legislature. Right. There's only four, le there's five swing legislative districts in the state. That where the registration uh, percentage is within five, where the way they've draw, drawn the districts, Republicans and Democrats are within five points of each other. But then you look into the primary and you think about unaffiliated voters, those people who aren't voting, uh, you know, that, that are now the largest portion of the electorate in Maricopa County. In order for them to vote, well, they can't run because you're barred from running in a primary election. So I'm paying for that with my tax dollars. So, I, but I can't run in it um, as a as a candidate. I can't be on that. I can only be on the general election ballot. In order to get on the general election ballot, I have to get six times as many signatures as they do to get on the general election ballot, um, and it creates this atmosphere where everybody. It, it, uh, where it's a binary choice, where it's this or this. So you've created this atmosphere with all the money where it's just negative, 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 negative. You know, you're bad. You know, you're worse. No, you're bad. No, you're worse. And so we created this culture through the systemic system that we have where we have to take these unaffiliated voters and in, put them on the ballot with everybody and allow people the broadest choice possible. And that would incent those candidates then to have a narrative of, I'm not gonna criticize that guy because everybody can vote for me now. And so I'm just gonna tell people what, what a great person I am. I'm gonna tell them what I believe. I'm not gonna attack, you know, uh, there, there's not just one other candidate on the ballot. There's maybe four, maybe five candidates on the ballot. So it's the good old American idea of competition. Mm -hmm. So let's create a competition of ideas allow everybody to compete in that and let the voters decide. You know, what we have today is a Soviet style uh, grocery shopping system of aisle, the blue aisle or the red aisle. And there's only certain products on those two aisles. And that's all you get to choose Great from. Great analogy. That wouldn't be America. That's mm -hmm. not what, you know, uh, and, and then all the advertising that you're getting is on the blue aisle or the red aisle. Yeah, there's a consequence also of more people disassociating with the two parties, which That's is those parties are becoming more ideologically distilled. Why more unaffiliated, my, why more people are becoming independents or unaffiliated? Because I don't want to shop there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's, a, um, there's a disease in the system right now. Like, like other things that have happened in life, we can fix this. Have you seen any states take... do anything that began to change sure, it? Sure, Alaska just did it last time. what they, they do? They created an open primary system 
where everybody can everybody can run you, you vote and they've created this opportunity where you can vote for more than one candidate you can vote for your favorite candidate your second favorite candidate your third favorite candidate or your fourth favorite candidate and then the, then so there's four candidates so let's let's take the option of like you have four brands out there that you've picked the guy with the, the least supported brand the one that no, the fewest people like loses uh, immediately unless fi somebody gets 50 percent of the vote if the once you get 50 percent of the vote you win when that fourth guy drops out those the their third their first place votes those that their their second place votes for that fourth candidate get redistributed and then in t and then you keep doing that until you get 50 percent of the vote it's called ranked choice voting that's an option. The other thing they had on the ballot in Alaska was banning dark money. Mm -hmm. So requiring people to disclose who's paying for that communication. Because right now you say, you know, oh, it's the it's the citizens for a better America. Well, who's not for that? Mm -hmm. And then an ad comes out completely slaying the candidate that they're they're opposed to, and you're like, oh, so that cut my must be so horrible. Well, he must oppose a better America. Yeah, he poses a better America, <laughs> Paul. We'd never not. That guy is a horrible person. Uh, and so we'd want to make sure that we want to know who's, who's paying for that. Because once, let's say Paul Johnson gave to that campaign, gave to that citizen for a better America. And I'm going to put Paul Johnson's name on the disclosure sheet because once you disclose your name, you're like, eh. Maybe I don't want to do that. Oh, anymore. definitely. I they, don't if, want to do that. Yeah, it's a lot easier to attack somebody if you don't if, have to take responsibility yeah, for it. Yeah, the most conservative, just Anton Scalia, when after Citizens United, he said, "Yeah, part of being an American is standing in the public square. You have to have to be in the public square. It's what makes America great. Freedom of speech. Say it. Own it." You know, we and if you want to be an idiot, go be an idiot. But then you're going to be known like that. And so that takes courage today because you get doxxed. You get all these things that happen. The woke but society. The, and, welcome yeah. to America. Uh -huh. I mean, welcome. We're not getting, you know, yet. We're not getting hung yet. Right. Yeah. They were. The, they took you uh, the founders, the founders were under <laughs> treason to get hung. Uh -huh. Although we did have a state senator who got censured in Arizona yeah. yesterday who wanted to hang her political enemies. Yeah. Um, that's fine. She's, you know, I feel bad for people like that because they've really lost the notion of America as the greatest country on earth, the freest country on earth, the most product, I mean, the most economically productive uh, country that's ever existed. I mean, if you're born in this country, you won the DNA lottery. It's unbelievable that we have the opportunity we do every day to get up, to go where you want, to drive on a freeway, to buy your own gas, to you know engage in commerce that you can engage in, to have your children publicly educated, that we educate everybody, at least give them the opportunity to. It's amazing we to watch. We have a public safety system. Police will arrive at your home. Firefighters will arrive at your home. Medical services will arrive at your home. I mean, you know, I just look around today and I go, what happened to the gratitude? What happened to the gratitude? I get up every day and I go, thank you. I, first, before I hit, my, hit the floor, I, I, in, I discipline myself to say, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity today. Let me be an opportunity for good. Today. All right. So I'm going to come back to that one minute. All right. I just want to finish this on the, the reform issue. On the reform issue, uh, there are many, many good things about the country, but there are also some things we can make better. We don't have to ignore things that uh, right. we can make better at the same time. Uh, we talked about uh, other states that have begun to change their system. It's also important that cities change their system about 50 years ago. There yeah. was a great reform that happened, and all the cities took the parties out of being in charge of it. You could shop on more than two aisles. That mean the parties couldn't be involved. Great point. That's they, exactly, Arizona has an example of this already. Mm -hmm. That's how we elect, with the exception of one city, uh, Tucson. Every other city in Arizona is nonpartisan, open primary, anybody can run. And and today we do we do polling on, you know, what's your satisfaction with each level of government? Least satisfactory, federal. Better, but still not great state. County, a little bit better. Cities always get a high approval rating. Why? They're not partisan. They're functional entities designed to deliver many of the things I just talked about. 
fire, police, sewer, water, garbage, garbage, everything that you have to have every day is mm -hmm. delivered by your municipality. And it's great. I mean, mm -hmm. unbelievably great that we have these type of municipal services available. I mean, by the way, you turn the on the tap every morning and go, wow. I would argue the same with the legislature, right? They're dealing with clean water issues. They're dealing with building public roads. They're dealing with our public educational system. Why do you need a highly partisan system to try to figure out how to deliver that service? The answer is you don't. You don't, but it's what they're feeding you. Mm -hmm. Th those entities that dominate partisan politics, back to Washington and our founders, are now feeding a partisan rhetoric all the time okay, to their so, own benefit. So I find that to be fascinating in politics, and that is there's this sense that your house is on fire. All right, you're, you're watching television on a nightly basis, listening to the politicians, and it's like your house is on fire. The truth is their house is on fire. Yeah. Their house is on fire because they have an election that they're running. Yeah. Yeah. And in one year or two years, they're going to be in front of the voters. And they need to convince you in that short period of time, your house is on fire. But it's well, really not you, just that segment of the electorate that they're actually having to mm -hmm. face, that primary electorate they're having to face. And, and so that fight, as it perpetuates itself, begins to make people think, that everybody's fighting like that. Right. But the reality is, it's not everybody. No. It's a very small portion of the public that is really in that food fight. Do you agree with that? When it comes to really significant issues, uh, and a great example of that was two years ago, there was a, Arizona's the only state that is in part of the Colorado River Compact, which is water. Mm -hmm. Arizona's always done water really well because it's not been partisan. Mm -hmm. And the Arizona legislature had is the only state, the only legislature that has to prove our compact with the Colorado River Authority. Well, that had to be renegotiated. And everybody's like, oh no, this is <laughs> never gonna happen. This is not gonna happen. Uh, luckily, we had a guy, the Speaker of the House, Rusty Bowers, who has a long history of leadership and nonpartisanship and water um, history with him. And he led a process um, that we all participated in that outside the legislature with, with ver a lot of parties and everybody came to an agreement and that agreement was brought down and it passed unanimously. I mean, that's the way the system ought to work, yeah. right? That's the, and it does work uh, on a number of occasions, but that get, doesn't get any attention, right? Yeah. That doesn't get any attention because that, is, that, that is worked. True. You know? Yeah, and, then, and the, so the medias are playing a part in that. All right, I want to go to this transition that happened in your life. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I like the old Chuck. I like the fighting Chuck, even though you were beating the heck out of me at times. I respected how good you were at that. You were outstanding at it. Pretty good. But there's definitely a different Chuck that I'm talking to today in terms of how you see the system, in terms of your legacy. What happened? What took place? Uh, personal challenges, uh, family challenges in the nineties, uh, had an ex brother-in-law who was, a, you know, sort of a, uh, was a Christian with me, went to Israel, got dunked in the Jordan river, you know, learned from him about, uh, and from the Bible, you know, what is it that God really wants? You know, what, what is it that God really wants for me? What was, what was Christ's ministry to this earth about? Uh, and what did he have to say? And, you know, what I've learned from that journey is that uh, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, it is a revolutionary sermon about humility, about peacefulness, about kindness, about all of the characteristics which he was preaching to and which have been <laughs> co-opted by institutions now. But what he said you know, I love you. I love you. And I want to have a personal relationship with you. And you're valuable. And if you want, I, just accept me, accept me as that. And if you want to reflect goodness in your life, he said, here's the fruits that I want you to show. I said, love, patience, peace, kindness, humility, uh, goodness, uh, uh, you know, uh, self-control was in there. Um, I, I used to keep a card with me. So, and what I and and there's a you know I I sort of have this verse in my head now about living. anger resides in the lap of fools, and so there's there's every opportunity in life to reflect His grace, and if you don't, if you're missing that, you're missing an opportunity. You're missing the opportunity to reflect His goodness 
And and that is it's not you know that that's a miss. That's a miss where you can put the bat on the ball for him because he saved you, you know, and so that gets into, you know, a part of Christian faith is that you have an opportunity here to reflect his grace. I imagine people taking home all the angst they see on television, <laughs> all the angst that they watch with their political parties and taking it home to their nine-year-old son, right? And, yeah. and, and getting things out of whack. Right in their mind, and not recognizing all the goodness around you them. You got to start. You got to start with, you know, as Cicero said, gratefulness is the greatest virtue. And if you start from a, a position of gratitude, you know, for life. If you know, I got up this morning. I walked out in the yard. I, you know, it's dark. I looked up, and there's you know Venus and Mars. I'm like, they're bright. They have, they're bright this yeah, time of year. Yeah, I saw them running this right, morning. Right ahead, and I'm like, wow, that is spectacular. That's spectacular that there's two planets orbiting out there, and that's so cool. And then I looked around at the other stars. It's a cool morning, you know, and it's a clear sky, but it's cold. I'm like, yeah, I get it back inside, <laughs> you know. And you just, you know, wake up in the morning. And I look at my wife and I go, unbelievable that she's with me. That's awesome. That's an awesome gift that he gave me. You know, just you have to dispose your mind, even in the midst of all. You know, people say, well, God can't. You know, it's, there's so much evil in the world. Uh-huh. I get that. But everything here is an opportunity to reflect. What do him. people have to be grateful for here in your mind? All the things I just said. I mean, uh -huh. we were on the DNA lottery. I mean, <laughs> I know I'm on the top of that pole. I yeah. get that. I get that. I, I go out and I'm, I, but I, you know, quick to listen, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. I wanna. I went to an event last night called Arizona Speaks, and I heard a bunch of people who aren't at all like me, who are going through struggles and trying to identify where they're at. But the key part is having your identity in something permanent, not that's going to change, not that is arbitrary. It's your identity is in something permanent. My identity is in Him. So, you know, my identity is not in my sexuality. My identity is not as a Republican or a Democrat. My identity is in gratitude and a service to him because he's given us that opportunity. And so do I live up to that every day? Hell no. I mean, no, 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 no. I miss the mark every single day. Thank God for his grace and his goodness because then I can get up the next day. I put my feet on the floor again. And I have another swing at the plate where I can do good. So, so, it, so today we get angry so often. We we get polarized so often, you know. Where you know, there's a it, the minute you feel that, that's when I go to my list. I go, okay, what do you want me to do? You know, what do you want from me? I fail. I admittedly fail a, a number of times every day. I get better as I get older. But um, I, I know there's an opportunity there to display grace, to display his grace. To, and it, it, is, it is a virtue every single time that I go through the list. Um, it's in Galatians. You can read it yourself. Uh, there's, a, there's a list there that I know that I'm sometimes missing something. Self-control is often one that I'm missing. So I go, okay, and I've learned that now. I'm like, okay, you got to get better at that. You got to get better at controlling yourself and your emotions and then look to say, what's the next place I need to go um, to serve you, to, to be an example of your grace and your goodness. Um, joy, you know, just be joyful. I mean, find something to be joyful about. Everybody should have, just like I said, look at the environment that we're in. We're born in America to to great opportunity. Um, people are suffering here. There's no doubt about it. I have very different opinions on our immigration and border security system, but recognize what people are trying to do there. You know, they're trying to drive you apart, and it takes courage to bring people together. I used that as an example last night when I I did I served Governor Brewer for a while. Very, very difficult times where the 1070 thing came up and the immigration crisis was happening. Later on in that administration, we had the opportunity to expand or Medicaid uh, coverage. So Medicaid is co health care coverage for the poor, for uh, people who are at or below or near the poverty line, for families, childless adults. Um, and so what we had an opportunity. 
nine percent of republicans approved of the affordable care act we had an opportunity to expand the affordable care act in arizona with nine percent of her own party we got it done um that was a remarkable display okay, of leadership, leadership on her part mm -hmm. because she understood she was compassionate, had a history of um, mental health care things in her family where she was super compassionate about that. She was super compassionate about homelessness. As the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors, she um, helped establish the homeless campus downtown. We need to do more of that now, people. But she was there on both of those issues. She, she did the long, longest running litigation of health care in, in the state. It was Arnold V. Sarn, which was the health care, um, overseeing mental health care in Arizona, she resolved that. Then this opportunity came up. She was paralyzed. I mean, she, was, she felt she'd done enough, but she knew she had a <laughs> calling to go do this. And it was uh, a brutal political experience for her and for the Republicans who supported her. At the time, both legislative bodies were, were three quarters majority Republican. It was not like it is today with you know uh, one, one or two seat votes. majority yeah. it was dominant 60 plus percent coverage by 66 by republicans so it, it was unbelievably difficult andy biggs the chairman current chairman of the freedom caucus in congress was the senate president he could have blocked he could he tried we rolled him Mm -hmm. which is something you never do in a, <laughs> as a governor unless you're near, near the end of your term yeah. because that's going to leave a mark when you roll the Senate president. We did. She did. Um, with the support of, I think it was nine Republicans uh, in the Senate who sat there and we decided when we were doing it, you have to debate a bill on the floor. And they wanted to debate their colleagues. They wanted to go at them. They wanted to accuse them of being socialists, of being Obama lovers, of being big government lovers, of being all this stuff. Without getting into the details, they were just going to hurl insults at them. We told them the best strategy was to just sit there and take it. Do not answer a question. And it, will the senator yield? No. And just let the gas run out of the balloon. And it's terminated the debate more quickly. The vote went on. The vote passed. Today, 280,000 people in Arizona have access, at the time, that was the number, have access to health care on the Medicaid program that they didn't have before. By a Republican governor. By a Republican by a governor. Conservative. In a re conservative Republican governor with a conservative Republican leg legislature. You know, That's the, leadership. The, uh, the gratitude that we were talking about a moment ago that you were going through, you pointed out that was in Galatians. Um, you know, I think about what's happening uh, certainly um, today in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there are people there who are willing to, to die to try yeah. to get the, they just have a fraction of the freedoms that we have, but they want to keep them. I'm certain that the political freedom matters to them, the ability to choose who their leaders are. But I'm also sure that the other freedoms that we take for granted, they appreciate. The freedom not to be arrested because you have a different point the of view. The Bill of Rights in this country. Yeah, the Bill that, of Rights. That, that protects us. You know, I was reminded yesterday, um, I wish by the president would have referenced it last night in his speech, was uh, Kennedy went to the Berlin Wall in 1963, and he made a great speech about... Uh, I, ich bin ein Berliner, and he said, we are all Berliners today because people were being denied, fruit, could be denied their freedom, and that freedom, freedom in its per best sense, as we've been talking about, is the freedom to serve others, is the freedom to help others, not personal liberty of doing whatever I want to do, properly understood as the founders defined freedom was to serve others. We have a commitment, as we just talked about, to be able to serve others. Um, and that was understood at the time. And so it's something we've lost today is the idea, you know, in the, in, in the uh, uh, there's a word for it in Hebrew uh, that it was just on my mind, but that, that the notion that somebody sacrifices themselves for the greater good of the community is is what freedom really is you know and the, we see that today i had a, a friend i don't know if you recall abraham scholars but he uh was kind of the, the madison grade school 
champion. He was uh, mm-hmm. he had taught Yiddish schools. Any event, he uh, he wanted to work with me on, uh, or he spent a lot of time talking to me about the Torah and the Talmud, yeah. which was kind of fun. I really enjoyed learning about it. Yeah. But he liked to talk about there were different sections of our life. There's the spiritual side, yeah. uh, community side. Then there's the intellectual. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the physical. There's the friends and family. And then your occupation. Now, I add one to that, the political side. Yeah. There's a political side. Well, it was your occupation for a while. That's right. right. That's true. But you you can't let that overpower. No, it has to be. It has to be it in perspective. It has to be undergirded with a philosophy. Mm-hmm. And and it should be a philosophy of serving others. Mm-hmm. Not just your little narrow band of the party. I mean, a governor who gets elected is elected to serve the state. Mm-hmm. When you're elected um, for, on a statewide basis, you're elected to serve everybody. The president is elected to serve everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, I've always said there's... Uh, you know, there's 51 good jobs in the in the country that are political on a national basis. Uh, that's the president and the 50 the 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 50 governors mm-hmm. because they really are the executives and they're really people who have an opportunity to show leadership. And that those are the people we we look to to follow that demonstrate the sadik sadikim was the mm-hmm. word. You know, they're, they're, and, and so that wanna, you want to see that. You want to mm-hmm. see them, as Jan did on Medicaid, as Jan did when she passed a tax in the bottom of the recession, put mm-hmm. it on the ballot. You want to see people who are doing things for the benefit of everybody, not just themselves. Mm-hmm. And we see so much of that in politics today is people just serving to benefit themselves. And, and that's just not healthy. Yeah, Tip it, O'Neill. I, I met with Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan wow. for dinner one night. Wow. D- literally that's four people. Cool. And, and I got to speak to them right after Ronald Reagan left office. He came to Arizona. And uh, I had a chance to spend two hours listening to both of them. I, I don't... And- I tried not to put in two words, right? Right. But each of them kind of gave. That's hard for you. Oh, yeah. That was really hard for me. <laughs> this has been a really tough conversation here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the longest time I think I've ever had to talk to I, I remember <laughs> when we were on that boat the very first time that we were put together by Jerry Boys. Yeah. Who said, okay, so I used to take Paul and I'd hang out with him and then I'd hang out with you guys. But I brought you guys both because I want to hear you guys fight it out. Yeah. And you and I went into that discussion. I go, well, I think when you guys were doing this, you did this because we had a disagreement. He said, we didn't have a disagreement with you on that. We needed to pummel you on that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, but um, when I listened to, to Tip and Reagan, first they were friends. That was yeah. a fascinating thing. They they really had a friendship that they both enjoyed. Right. Um, and then uh, Tip had this great poem that uh, I love. But uh, but nonetheless, the the point that Tip made during the meeting um, was the most important thing that you have when you get done with all of this are the friendships that you make. And sometimes it's the people that you disagree with yes. that you can have the best yes. relationships yes. with because they're, they're, they're intriguing, they're fun, they're enjoyable. Yeah. Who wants to be around somebody all the time that's disagreeing with them all the time? Why you know? let politics get in, the way of that. get in the way of loving your son or your daughter or, yeah. or dating someone that you want to or letting them date someone yeah. that they want to? Why disrupt Thanksgiving dinner over this. So to me, the portion that you were talking about, your personal philosophy, yeah. that that allows you to put other things above just winning, just politics, becomes something that's not just life changing for you, but it's life changing for people around you. Well, it's yeah, building relationships is at the core of everything that I think at the end of the day you just said that we can do. And yeah. so how do we want to be remembered? How do we want to be thought of? What What am I doing to reflect his grace? Am I doing that? That's the largest opportunity in my life um, that I w- wonder every day. I want to make sure I'm doing that. And I ask myself a lot of questions every day about that too. Am I aligned that way? Am I doing this for me or am I doing this for somebody else? You know, And that's a big ego question because your ego can get in the way a lot of the times because you know, the, the good devil is around all the time. He's, he resides in us. Literally, there's spirits here that say, no, go do that. Go do that because it'll make you look better. It, it'd be good for you. It may, but we know that it, it may not. And, and that's the true, as I was talking about J- Jan and that, those issues. When you step into the arena and you know that and you know that your friends are going to be critical of you, you need him. You need his confidence. You need that spirit of confidence. You need that spirit in you. Otherwise, you don't go there. 
because who's going to do that, yeah. right? Who's not going to? Because it's easy to serve politics with just serving your own self interest. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that, and but we also know that in order to if the country and the institutions to survive, that it needs people who sacrifice themselves for the good of the the, the state. Well, I know this. Um, I have deeply appreciated the fact that uh, by being able to set that aside, I was able to grow a friendship with you. That friendship has been very yeah. valuable to me. I've learned a lot from you, and I can't imagine not have been able not have being able to have the gifts that you've been able to offer in that process. So thank you, Chuck. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank, thank, thank John's okay. Yeah, no, if you put me in his life, yeah, John's um, fun. Uh, you know, it's it's been an honor. Um, you know, getting to know you uh, and uh, the evolution of our relationship. I, I like you're saying, um, it's so deeply um, helpful to have that context, Paul, that we can. We can grow together that way, and I can look back and go, there's a friend I know I can count on, I know I can call, and we work with each other that way, and it's it makes my heart glad. Thanks, brother. Thanks, All right, this is Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American. Thanks for being here, and thanks for joining us while we talked about hope. 